Hello and welcome to Dragon Bites, the paediatric podcast aimed at paediatricians and paediatricians in training. My name is Kelly Kenny and I am a paediatric trainee working in South Wales. Today I've got the privilege to introduce you to part two of our patent ductus arteriosus, a special podcast by the fantastic Professor Uzun and our very own Asim Javid. Enjoy. So you heard the machinery type, mama, and you almost certainly. Then you want to make sure that you have completed all the examination investigations. You will order a chest x-ray and ECG. Mm -hmm. So as, as it is common for all left to right shunts, what do you expect in PDA? So due to excessive pulmonary blood flow, what would you see? Oh, on a chest x-ray? Yes. You mean. So you might see increased pulmonary plethora? Excellent. Of the arterial or venous section? Of the... Upper zones or the lateral zones? The lateral zones. Wonderful. Upper zones would indicate... Venous. What, sir? Pulmonary venous. Venous problems, Wonderful. exactly. And the lateral? The arterial problem. Arterial. And those arterial um, branching or arterial parent would invade one third of out of space because mm -hmm. they don't normally go beyond two thirds of the lung field laterally. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yeah, exactly. So you'll see the right up to pretty much the lung edges, won't you? Correct. Yeah. And sometimes you may even see um, fluid in fissures. Mm. So you would see pulmonary plethora. How about the pulmonary artery? Would it look bulging? Pulmonary conus on the left side? Yeah, I think yes. So. Yeah. so pulmonary artery would look big mm. as a result of shunt being more than 1.5 or 2 to 1 compared to systemic circulation. Um, how about any other globally heart? Would it look enlarged? Um, let's have a think about this. So because you've got um, increased flow going to the arteries, but it depends on it depends on what stage it is because you could have increased flow going into the left atrium, couldn't you? Yes, yeah. significant shunt. Yeah. What do you expect? Then you'd have a, 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 you'd think of a larger left atrium, Correct. so you might see a um, a pronounced sort of left cardiac border and perhaps an okay. enlargement on that left side, Brilliant. because that would go down into the ventricle as well. Wonderful. So left side would be enlarged, therefore cardiac thoracic ratio would have increased. Mm. And where do you see left atrial enlargement best? In PA or AP or lateral? Oh gosh, I've no, I've, to be honest, I've never seen a lateral chest x-ray looking at hearts. Um, presumably in PA? I don't know. You see appreciated better from lateral chest x-ray, mm. but from PA or AP chest x-ray, you can also see a sign within mm. the right atrium. Mm. You see the left atrial border invading into right atrial space. You right. will see a double contour. Okay. So you need to look for it. Mm. A child, very symptomatic, machinery type murmur, failure to thrive, and symptomatic with breathlessness, intercostal recession, chest x-ray, heart is big. Look at the uh, right atrial shadow. Mm -hmm. If you see another parallel line uh, in the mesial or medial portion of the right atrial border mm. and that indicates left atrial enlargement mm -hmm. on AP that is the sign on the lateral um, chest x-ray you would expect the space between the atrial wall and the spine to be reduced mm. so it would be coming towards the trachea and esophagus sure so it might even cause obstruction to those structures wow very enlarged left atrium so sometimes feeding difficulties may not be just due to congestion in the gut or your esophagus, but maybe due to compression mm. and also the respiratory symptoms. Wow. So lateral aspect, the distance between the atrial wall and the spine would have disappeared or diminished. Mm -hmm. So that is very important. So do you see any other, can you see another um, uh, changes on the chest x-ray perhaps? Nothing that's coming to mind, but I suspect that there are more. <laughs> well, um, if um, patient develop pulmonary hypertension, of course, mm. things got worse, then you would see pruning mm. and it would just reverse. Yeah. So baby 
uh, has palpable second house sound, mm -hmm. loud second house sound, just historic murmur, and the ductus, um, it indicates that pro patient developed pulmonary hypertension. Mm -hmm. And in those patients, plethora would have left itself to pruning. Mm -hmm. So it would look, lung field would look clearer. Mm -hmm. And the main branches would be large, but the peripheral branches would be very small. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we don't usually see in this country. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you will never see that. <laughs> okay. It's not a nice thing to have. How about ECG? You're very curious and you want to develop your skill on ECG. <laughs> sure. So do you expect um, any changes on ECG in a, say, typical ductus with full-blown pictures, congestive heart failure? So let's talk about those. The others mm -hmm. may not show anything. Sure. Um, pulmonary hypertension one would show, mm -hmm. and the other one, significant duct. So those two. Sure. Start with the significant duct without pulmonary hypertension. So if, if you've got a, a significant duct, mm. um, you, yet again, we're looking at left-sided heart enlargement. So would we be thinking about, in the lateral leads, looking at um, signs showing us left-sided um, hypertrophy, tall waves, and so on? So tall, yes, tall mm. QRS complexes. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. And what else do you expect from these patients? Left atrium is also big. What is the sign of left atrium enlar atrial enlargement in, on, on ECG? Would that be something to do with P waves, bifid P waves? Yes, That's wonderful. Right. So you you have P wave having a notch on it. Mm. What do we call it? P mitrale. Mm -hmm. So you may have um, two peaks yeah. on the lead one. And you may have biphasic P waves in V1. Mm -hmm. So lead one and lead two might show positive but with a notch, two peaks, mm -hmm. we call that P mitrale. But lead V1, precordial right sided lead, might show small positive component but large negative component. Mm. Normally you have larger positive and very small negative or no negative component. Um, but if you see large negative component of the lead V1, then it indicates again left atrial enlargement. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing perhaps um, to search for, sure. just out of curiosity. If patient develop pulmonary vascular disease, then of course you would see a sign of uh, LVH as well as RVH mm. and um, uh, increased RV forces, of course. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Echocardiogram uh, is going to be the next. We already mentioned about echocardiogram, um, but hopefully you know my desire, all of you to acquire this skill mm. to a certain extent to look for function, to look for effusion or tamponade, to look for ductus. Those three things are very important that we should arm you guys in the future, mm. in my view. Um, so ductus is one of them. So when you do echocardiogram, um, the main findings are Dilated left atrium, left ventricle, so volume loaded left sided structures, mm -hmm. large aorta, and uh, large ductus arteriosus in those babies um, or in, the, in those children. And if the left atrium and left ventricle is large, mitral valve wouldn't co opt tightly in the middle and it would lead to a little bit regurgitation and leakage mm -hmm. if the things are getting worse. So mitral regurgitation can also be seen. To obtain the ductal um, patency or to show the ductal shunt, you need to go to what we call it high parasternal view mm -hmm. and you demonstrate ductus, descending aorta and pulmonary artery. Mm -hmm. And you show the shunt, you measure the size of ductus, you measure the velocity across the ductus, speed of blood. The higher the velocity, the better the outcome. Right. If the velocity high, higher than four meters per second in systole, it tells you that systemic pressure is higher than the pulmonary artery. I see. Hence, this patient doesn't have pulmonary hypertension. Mm. And the other thing to look at, the um, velocity of the diastolic flow. If mm. there is diastolic flow and the velocity is also high, then it is a good thing. But if patient has systolic flow only, no more than two and a half, three. And in diastole, you have very little flow, 
or coming to baseline or negative, then you would be worried. Mm. So you want high velocity jet and high velocity ductus um, diastolic flow, mm. not only systolic, but diastolic flow. Those are the things to look at. Sure. The other thing we check, left atrium to aortic root ratio. Mm. So we measure the aortic size, annulus size, where the valves are, and then we measure the left atrial size. Mm. And if the LA to aortic ratio is less than 1.5, that is insignificant duct. If it is between 1.5 and 2, significant duct. Over 2, that duct is um, not doing any good to this baby mm. and needs urgent attention. Attention. But between 1.5 and 1, um, you need to look at patient symptoms and decide whether surgery is needed, mm. whether treatment with medication will be needed. So now, now it comes to natural history. What shall we do? We've got a patient asymptomatic, mm. completely silent duct, no murmur. Sometimes silent duct may exist with systolic flow murmur, mm. which is innocent murmur. So you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be confused. If that murmur is not heard under the clavicle and disappears by stopping inspiration, mm. then it can't be related to duct. Mm -hmm. If the murmur persists below the clavicle, then it's not innocent murmur. Mm. Right? So it's not a silent duct. You don't do anything for these. Just leave them alone. Uh, we don't recommend any endocarditis prophylaxis, and they do lead to normal life. Mm -hmm. um, the ones symptomatic, then we try to buy time. Mm by doing the same treatment like we deploy for PSDs and um, other shunts. Mm -hmm. So tell me um, from basic measures to medication, what do we do for those patients? So we start off with feeding support, feeding. don't we? Good, excellent. Um, which can like involve NG tube, high calorie feeds, whatever you, you need to try and keep that calorific input Good. going up. Um, then we would talk about diuretics. To, what is the function of diuretics? What do they do? To Offloading. offload the heart. Yes. yes. So reduce the circulating blood volume, mm -hmm. offload, the, offload the heart. Mm -hmm. Usually what we do, we put them on spironolactone and prismite together. Mm -hmm. Some centers um, use uh, hydrochlorothiazide instead of prismite because of its effect on the oh, okay. otospirosis and sure. hearing problem, mm -hmm. especially in small babies. Um, uh, but in our center, we use spironolactone and prismite together. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can control heart failure, mm -hmm. what we do, we add a second medication mm -hmm. in addition to diuretics. That's right. It's afterload reduction. Mm -hmm. Can you remember any afterload reduction agent? So I can remember the last two that we discussed, which was hydralazine. Wonderful. And we also discussed digoxin, but this was a bit further down the line. But okay. there was something else that came with hydralazine, and I'm trying to remember what it was. The essential one, which is captopril. Captopril, that's it. <laughs> so, so ACE inhibitors that's it. Uh, are the mainstay of congestive heart failure treatment in children. Mm. But if children um, do not tolerate it because of low blood pressure when you give test dose, mm. or they develop potassium retention, or they have kidney problem, yeah. and we put them on hydralazine. hydralazine. If yeah. they don't tolerate hydralazine, then we put them on digoxin. Yeah. So this is good old digoxin, sometimes might be helpful. Mm -hmm. What is the purpose of doing this? Do you think they help um, treating duct? No, they just, it's, it's, so this is all measures to buy time for the baby to feed, grow, become to a better weight. I mean, assuming it's the same process that we use for yes. VSDs. Yes. It was Correct. to get them to a, a decent weight so as you could then start the process of closing things surgically um, or, you know, if needed. Or intervention. Or interventionally. So the, usually um, uh, the weight we're looking for, 8 kilogram. Mm. In the past, I personally did during my training closure of PDA in symptomatic children as small as 3.54 kilograms. Mm. But nowadays we don't do it. We wait until um, they reach 8 kilogram. Mm. And that is usually around 6 months to 12 months. Then we do go from the groin and put different devices, either a coil, hmm. spring coil, detachable spring coils, or we use uh, umbrella type devices. There are various products. Amplatzer one is most commonly used. Hmm. And it's done under general anesthetic in the cath lab. 
I say few hours procedure, day procedure, and they go home without any problem if there is no complication. And it takes um, between a um, few hours to 24 hours to duct completely close, mm -hmm. but epithelialization takes about six weeks. So shunt may appear small and uh, may gradually disappear in the next six weeks. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't close in the next two or three months, then you might need to go back and put another device in if the shunt is deemed significant. Mm -hmm. So our aim is to grow the baby to a size where you can get access and deploy those interventional devices mm -hmm. in patients who deserve an interventional treatment. Mm -hmm. If the duct is too big and you cannot deploy those devices, then you need to resort to surgery, which is exceedingly rare. Mm -hmm. In older children, we hardly use surgery in those babies unless the device did not did not get stuck to the pulmonary or aortic end and embolized. Mm -hmm. And in those patients, we do surgery without bypass, either ligation or clip. Mm -hmm. Sometimes surgeons do ligation as well as cutting the duct, mm -hmm. but majority of the time it is not cut; it's ligated or clipped. Mm -hmm. This is for bigger children, older children, um, and uh, children who may sometime benefit from waiting, the duct might get smaller. Yeah. Um, and it may not require anything. But how about children who were born prematurely and uh, they're not growing and they're stuck to ventilator, they're oxygen dependent. Do you think we may also manipulate the ductal patents to left pharmacological agents. Yeah, so I've seen this done. In fact, I've seen two different pharmacological agents used depending on which center the treatment was started in. So I've seen both paracetamol used and ibuprofen used as attempts to medically close the ductus. Was there another agent uh, historically? They, historically, I think, was it indometacine that used okay. to be used? Yeah. Why did, did it uh, fall in favor? I feel like there was oh. some sort of, uh, in, in studies, I'm not sure if this was in infants, but w wasn't there some sort of cardiac, some poor cardiac outcome in older people? But uh, th this, or I might be confusing with so Cox inhibitors. So bleeding problems, kidney failure, right. so it's resulting in such side effects. Mm -hmm. And th therefore it's abandoned. And um, trials show that ibuprofen would do the same job. Mm -hmm. And uh, even paracetamol um, would lead to a closure of ductus arteriosus less often than ibuprofen mm. and uh, the other manipulations could involve fluid restriction mm. in small babies optimization of ventilation and steroid tube mm -hmm. so those are the steps to take what i would say mm. since we change our protocol in wales we have looked at the result of our ductus arteriosus in extremely preterm and preterm babies and uh, we looked at the ones who were treated aggressively with conventional measures versus um, surgical ligation or pharmacological treatment. What we found out, the ones had surgery, the ones had aggressive treatment or pharmacological treatment had no change in their outcomes. Mm -hmm. There was absolutely no change in their mortality rates and long-term outcomes. So surgery is not necessary in most of the time is only indicated in few cases where you are absolutely sure that the conventional management aggressive medical management failed and baby is dependent on the ventilation mm -hmm. and cannot be taken off the ventilator in those cases you do um, day case surgery you ligate the duct and you keep on the neonatal unit for a day and then you transfer across the neonatal unit again um, and take it from there. Mm -hmm. What we found out in those babies, if um, they had surgery and uh, didn't have surgery, necrotized and enterocolitis a risk was higher in babies who had medical treatment. We don't know the reason. Um, we also looked at the um, intraventricular hemorrhage rate was slightly higher in babies treated medically, mm. but this did not reach statistical significance. Those are the things for you to remember. So we only manipulate those 
um, ductuses with pharmacological agents in preterm babies. Mm. If the baby reached preterm age, uh, or if the um, preterm baby is beyond um, perhaps uh, four to six weeks of age, beyond that, they don't respond to pharmacological agents. Mm. So if they are younger than six weeks, um, they, they have a good chance. Usually duct is um, responsive to medication uh, early on. Mm. I've seen only one or two cases where ductus responded to medication even a month or two months after birth mm. in preterm babies. Um, those, are, those are anecdotal cases. Um, as long as you're sure that the medication will not harm the baby, there is no harm in perhaps trying um, to see whether those medications might work. Mm. So that is all I would like to um, tell you about what I know. I'd like to hear your take home message like we do <laughs> for all cases. So um, let's start with the three factors that are important for the significance of a PDA. So with the size of, size of the PDA, the um, size of the shunt across the PDA and the pulmonary vascular resistance. And we also mentioned the difference between the systemic and pulmonary pressures as well at the end. Um, then we spoke also about the presentation of a PDA. So we're expecting bounding pulses, um, we're expecting um, increased work of breathing, and when we go to, uh, we're expecting an active precordium, we should be 50% certain of our diagnosis before we put our stethoscope on, and we have a listen, and we should be expecting a continuous murmur in a, um, uh, just below the clavicle. Um, and then finally, we went on to management. We want these babies to get to eight kilograms plus, so we use supportive management to get them to the right age, and then we're looking at intervention or surgery, depending on what, but surgery is relatively rare, and most things are done interventionally. Wonderful, excellent, brilliant. So what I would like to um, uh, remind everybody, li our listeners, to our listeners, in terms of ductus arteriosus, what you need to know, this is similar to um, VSD, in terms of presentation, in terms of, um, uh, auscultation and uh, uh, examination findings in terms of management that's what you need to remember retain this so similar um, to differentiate it uh, you need to remember the machinery murmur mm. yeah, machinery murmur it's not always there so lack of machinery murmur should not um, de deter you from making the diagnosis of PDA mm -hmm. if you hear the murmur and the clavicle that's the one message mm -hmm. so um, VSD murmur, lower sternal edge, mid sternal edge, continue, uh, the pansystolic murmur, but the ductal murmur is continuous, typical murmur, but sometimes you might have harsh systolic murmur under the clavicle, and if baby is symptomatic, then it's likely to be ductal murmur. So I'd like you to remember that. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily continuous. Continuous is specific, but harsh systolic murmur may also be relating to duct. That's one thing I'd like you to remember. Sure. Second thing is, preterm duct and the duct in all the children differ. Mm -hmm. Preterm duct is more physiological, the other one is anatomical abnormality. Mm -hmm. So hence, physiologic duct can be manipulated with pharmacological agent, but the anatomical one cannot. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing you need to remember. Mm -hmm. And the third thing I'd like you to remember in these patients, um, in uh, children with, with um, um, uh, PDA, you may develop some uh, untoward findings and untoward um, side effects if the PDA is not picked up in timely manner, if the baby looks not very breathless, if baby looks clubbed, if baby looks um, um, relatively asymptomatic despite looking a bit dusky and you hear on the systolic murmur not so loud but loud second heart sound you should look at baby's fingers and lips and make sure that there is no eyes and manga mm -hmm. even if it is rare in this country it's something very historical and I hope that we, we will never come across so I went to extremes mm -hmm. you went to more common ones <laughs> so I just wanted to emphasize that um, to everybody a um, few words about, about AP window because mm. it's not very uh, important thing and the, and the 
perhaps the differential diagnosis. So how do we differentiate um, ductal murmur um, from other pathologies which might give you continuous murmur? Let's uh, mention about the conditions would give you continuous murmur. One is called venous hum. Mm -hmm. You hear it um, on the usual right side, near superior vena cava, but it disappears with inspiration and expiration when you lie down. Mm -hmm. Ductal murmur doesn't disappear. Mm -hmm. So venous hum. Second thing is arteriovenous fistula. So you may have arteriovenous fistula in the lungs, maybe in the brain, we call it vein of Galen, mm -hmm. and maybe on the liver, maybe anywhere else on the body. So arteriovenous fistula. Again, in those patients, uh, as opposed to PDA, you wouldn't feel dynamic precordium unless the fistula is massive, causing um, high flow and uh, volume loading of the heart. Mm -hmm. It would be exceptional for peripheral arteriovenous fistula to cause such problem. Mm -hmm. And the um, other um, pathology is perhaps persistent ductus arterius, persistent um, truncus arteriosus, where you have one great vessel instead of aorta and the pulmonary artery uh, with separate origins. And in those patients, you might hear systolic and diastolic murmur, but it would be mainly in the um, left upper intercostal um, area, in the pulmonary or aortic area. Mm -hmm. And the murmur would be typically systolic and diastolic murmur, but clear differentiation of the uh, systolic and diastolic component. Mm -hmm. But in ductal murmur, you would not hear the second heart sound whatsoever, unless there is pulmonary abstention. Mm -hmm. So persistent ductus arteriosus, persistent truncus arteriosus, I do apologize. And the other one is aortopulmonary window. So aortopulmonary window is essentially ductus arteriosus, but without any tube. Mm. So the direct communication between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah. Is that what you... Well, that's what I understand of it, because I've never heard of it until you told me about it only a few weeks ago. Yes. So, yeah, correct. So it is actually, in those patients, usually duct is not present. Mm -hmm. So instead of duct, we have direct communication. So no separation of aortic and pulmonary valves. Mm. And therefore, murmur, mostly systolic, but you may have also systolic and diastolic murmur, to and fro murmur in those patients. Mm. So the findings will be similar to ductus. Mm -hmm. And the murmur would spread into lung fields, both lung fields. Mm. So that's the differentiating point from ductus arteriosus. In ductus arteriosus, it doesn't spread into the lungs. Mm. But the AP window, it would be distributed into right and left lung. Right. And the last thing is absent pulmonary valve syndrome, tetralogy of Fowler. Mm. In those patients, again, you would see blueness. Mm. If baby had VSD as well, and would be murmur again uh, in diastole and systole with clear separation of systolic and diastolic components. To and fro. But the uh, ductal murmur would be. Mm. But the uh, AP window or absent pulmonary valve would sound like. And the ductus arteriosus murmur. Something like that. Mm -hmm. So you would not hear the separation of systolic and diastolic component unless patient develop pulmonary abstention. Fab. Well, I would like to put a stop to this. <laughs> sure. And I hope this is enjoyable and it was productive. And I hope our listeners will listen and will benefit from it. Me too. And I, I, if no one else, I've certainly learned a lot. <laughs> I really enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Professor Uzu. Have a nice day. And that brings us to a close on our PDA talk. Thank you so much to Professor Uzan for his continued input into the Dragon Bites podcast series and, of course, to us. Um, I hope you enjoyed and I hope we've shed some light on understanding PDAs. Thank you.